Good evening everyone, welcome to another episode of Martini Mondays. And today Tony is going to make a cocktail called a Tuxedo Number no. 2. I think this is a really great uh, summer cocktail for people who want something with a clear uh, uh, spirit base, um, you know, but they want something with a little bit more richness. Uh, so maybe somebody who generally likes a Manhattan or an old-fashioned as their main go-to cocktail, like myself. Uh, but you know, during the hot summer months, that's a little bit too much uh, richness. This so gin based. So this is going to be gin based. So we want a dry gin to start, and um, then we're also going to need uh, dry vermouth. And I have Carpano Dry, which is a spectacular dry vermouth, and Luxardo Maraschino liqueur, which is a cherry flavored liqueur. And then we'll also need orange bitters, which I have here, and we'll need absinthe for a rinse, and I have an absinthe and an atomizer. So we're going to atomize the glasses with a bit of a absinthe. This is a very professional episode this week. Indeed. And uh, we'll take our glass, uh, stirring glass, full of ice, and we'll begin with about two dashes per drink of, of orange bitters. So about 16 to 20 drops per cocktail. A couple more. And then we're going to do a quarter ounce per cocktail of Luxardo Maraschino. And of course, all of this can be done to taste, but um, we're going to do three quarters of an ounce uh, per cocktail of uh, dry vermouth and this where it really comes to a matter of interpretation but we're going to do two and one quarter ounces of dry gin per cocktail and then we stir Thirty seconds. I say this every time. 30. Proper, proper dilution is just as important as the mixing. You know, the trip to New York that I had, where I first had this, was just one of the most epic New York trips. I it, it, I went to see Cabaret um, for the first time with um, Alan Cumming and Michelle Williams mm -hmm. at, mm -hmm. at Studio Fifty Four, wow. and had a table literally right up against the stage that just got last minute tickets for. That Alan Cumming was amazing in that. Really just incredible. It was one of the most amazing uh, performances of anything I've ever seen. And of course now he owns a dive bar on the Lower East Side. Does he really? I've seen him many times. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And then uh, we will strain this into our coops. Okay, and then an orange peel. You could also use a lemon uh, twist just to express a little bit of that citrus oil. And there we have it. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Mmm. Oh, that's really good. Yeah, that is really good. I love how the orange cuts through the vermouth. It it's does, really nice. yeah. Yeah, it's a very smooth vermouth. So I thought today would be a good chance to talk about um, how we select musicians for the symphony, which is an audition process. Uh, so we don't just interview and hire people. It's a, a, a process by which everyone is invited nationally and internationally, and they um, audition over a, a couple day period. So uh, this all begins um, we will announce this in these various publications two to three months out uh, from the audition date. And then we select a committee of musicians from the orchestra who are going to work with you in the selection process. And we select seven musicians, many of whom are from the family of whatever instrument we're auditioning. So if we're auditioning for clarinet, say, we'll have members from, uh, of the flutes and oboe 
bassoon, and then other musicians from the orchestra uh, for a total of seven members of that committee, and they will begin to receive uh, resumes from applicants. And depending on what uh, instrument is being auditioned for, that could be as many as 200 or more resumes that come in that we're choosing from. And then they will narrow it down to um, whom we're going to invite to do a live audition in Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. And uh, that really is dep depends on how many can we hear and go through all these rounds over a two-day process, typically. So talk about, um, you know, it begins with a preliminary round. Uh, talk about what each candidate might, uh, might what their experience might be like in, that, in, in their time that they have allocated for them. So it's good to notice that um, people always ask, you know, are people local? And obviously not. This is the auditions that we have are open to everybody in the whole world, basically. And we get a large number of people from all over the place. Um, so once the people are chosen to come to Jacksonville, um, it'll usually be over a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And the committee, those seven musicians who've been chosen, really do the, the huge amount of work because in the preliminary round, they're hearing, you know, maybe a hundred candidates each for a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. And they have to make really quick decisions to get everything kind of narrowed down into a second round. Um, the musicians who are auditioning are playing a piece of solo Bach uh, the first movement of a concerto, a standard concerto for their instrument, but most importantly, orchestral excerpts. And those are little fragments of music that are solos for that instrument from the orchestral repertoire right. or particularly difficult tutti passages. Um, and these are quite standard excerpts from audition to audition, so people will be used to playing these things. Um, but but they're, they're given these excerpts in advance, what the excerpts oh, yeah, will be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they know that it won't be a surprise what they're being asked to play. No, nothing is, there's no sight reading component to, to the audition. Everything is prepared. Um, and I mean, it pretty much has to be perfect. If, I mean, if, if, if you make a mistake, it's basically over. Yeah. I mean, sometimes somebody might be incredibly musical and you forgive a mistake, but pretty much not. Especially in the first round. Especially at the beginning, yeah. Um, and everybody's numbered, and this is all taking place on stage in Jacoby Hall with the candidates behind a huge screen. So the committee can't see the candidates, and there's even a carpet so that the, the committee can't hear if the candidate is wearing heels. Mm -hmm. So there's no way of there being any kind of um, gender discrimination. Um, there's no communication, the candidate never speaks, so you can't tell if it's a man or a woman. Um, which is great, because it forces the committee to really only use their ears and be released of any kind of prejudice. And it was originated to, uh, uh, as a solution against gender bias. Yeah. When, you know, you go back into the 1970s, um, and there were many orchestras around the world, uh, the most major orchestras that had a very small, if any, uh, uh, representation by women or minorities. And yeah. it, was, it was designed to give essentially equal uh, opportunity for the best player to be chosen. Yeah, and interesting, you know, that one very famous European orchestra which doesn't use blind auditions, the Vienna Philharmonic, only got its first woman a few years ago, so... As a, as a contracted musician. Yeah, yeah. so th um, the system works. Yeah. Here. So they have those preliminary round, then they go into a second round, the same thing happens again, they'll play diff different excerpts. The committee will slice it down again, and then we get to semi-finals. And at that point, we'll have maybe 10 candidates. And I come and join the committee at that part and listen, but don't vote. So they're still deciding who goes through the final, but I'm there just to give myself a little bit more context for what happens in the final. And the committee is just voting by simple majority, either yeah. by number of yes, it's either yes or no, yeah, up, or, uh, up or down yeah. kind of. It's it's um, acceptable or not acceptable mm -hmm. at that point, above right. the line or below the line. Right. And then the final happens, and the final could be a number of parts, but the musician will repeat some of the repertoire that they've played before. Um, there'll be special excerpts just for the final, but I can also ask the candidate to play anything from the entire list of any of the rounds, because I haven't been able to be there until that point. Um, and 
then they might play ensemble. For example, if it was a trombone audition, they might play with the rest of the trombone section, still blind, so that those musicians can tell the committee how they felt the musician responded to them, and I, and I can hear that. Um, and then at that point, the musicians again decide who is above the line, who's acceptable, who's not, who's below the line. And at that point, um, the musicians are then finished, and I'm given that, that vote that they had with acceptable or unacceptable. For all the, peop all, all all the, the people, all the the people in that final round. And then I choose somebody from that final list. Uh, of those who were up, up a above majority was above the line. Yeah. Yeah. And there tends to be consensus. You know, often when we get to that point, there's only one or two people who are above the line. Mm -hmm. um, so there isn't, there isn't as much agency for me as you might expect. Right. It's very clear by that point who the right people are. Sometimes there might be a bit of disagreement in the, in the committee or two candidates are neck and neck. Mm -hmm. And in that situation, then my vote does count. Um, but it's interesting because a lot of the musicians have already done the vast majority of the work, but at the same time, there's nobody else who's on all these committees except me. Right. So even though I'm removed until the end, I'm the only person who has heard every possible candidate in the finals because the committees change from audition to audition because it's just so much work for them to do. So what are you listening for? I mean, you're uh, even in the finals, you're listening for a few minutes. I mean, six, seven, eight, nine minutes. What are you listening for to determine if this is somebody that you want playing a critical role um, for the next, yeah, potentially a lot of years? Well, accuracy to start. By the by, the final everybody's playing very well. Right. But even in the final, you know, the intonation is really important, particularly if it's a wind player. That's how high or low they play. Like, can they play perfectly in tune? Mm -hmm. um, can they adjust when you ask them to change something? Do they have a musical point of view? Do they play a musical phrase? Or is it just a computer? And the robot musician is not very interesting for anybody. So we want to see a point of view and a kind of musical um, line. Then if it's a wind player, obviously you're thinking, I'm going to hear this person every time there's a clarinet solo for the rest of time. Mm -hmm. So is it beautiful? Because you're not yeah. going to tell a soloist what to do. You know, when you work with the principal winds, you encourage them on the, the journey that they're already on. Right. So you want to see a real spark of artistry. Um, if it's a string player, quite often here, because we have a smaller string section, I want somebody who makes a lot of sound, mm -hmm. like who plays loud. Right. Because we have fewer people and we want, not just to play loud all the time, but who can really do that when yeah. you ask for it. Right. Um, and then of course, the final part of the audition is, once a winner is announced, that person will then come for a trial and we'll have a real week with them, or maybe two weeks, mm -hmm. when they play in the orchestra. And um, that's up to me to decide if they have a trial or not. We can simply award a job on the spot, right. or we can say, we want you to come for a trial, and then we'll make a decision. We can invite two different people for a trial. We try not to, because it ends up being really expensive. Mm -hmm. um, but that's another way to really see how somebody fits into the orchestra. Yeah, and they, they come for a week, which is all the rehearsals plus the performances yeah. with you. Yeah. Yeah. So for example, when we had the clarinet audition recently, mm -hmm. there were two winners at the audition, and two people came, both did a trial, and then um, it was so obvious to all of us who the right person was, right. and then Giovanni got the job. But that was, that was an example where the, it took a really long time. Yeah, it can, it can be a months long process, especially if the summer kind of uh, divides the, the process. Yeah, and the also we have to do things like we've got to be careful that we don't put an audition at the same time as another, particularly a bigger orchestra right. than us, has the same position open, which happens right. all the time, yeah. because then no candidates will come to us. Yeah, our personnel manager is really great so, about uh, you know, communicating with other personnel managers, mm -hmm. orchestra personnel managers around the country to talk about when everyone's scheduling their auditions to avoid stepping on each other and forcing musicians to choose either auditioning for this orchestra or or the other because yeah. um, that doesn't do anybody any favors no but also that shows you why it's really important that we pay our musicians well yeah because people don't come to auditions and, unless they have a good salary and when i came here before the new contract we had a hard time there were some auditions where we didn't appoint anybody because it just 
there wasn't the right. That's candidate. a real thing. A, a no hire audition yeah, happens all the time. Right. And that has not happened since the new contract because people, musicians, see the Jacksonville Symphony as an orchestra that respects its musicians and that wants to pay them fairly, and mm -hmm. that that's really helped. That has been the kind of key linchpin in building the orchestra. Right. Um, because now the quality of candidates that we have is so high mm -hmm. and, and really exciting. So sometimes, uh, when, especially when you're talking about certain sections within an orchestra, you hear a certain sound that is identifiable uh, to that orchestra's section, like Cleveland's brass section or, um, and, or, or even um, a European string section, which I would assume is the result of a music director who has a certain timbre or, or color in their ear. What, what, how, do, how does that um, come, come to pass? How, how, do, how, do, how does one decide what sound that they're looking for? And um, have you, do you think you've had an impact in that uh, way here in your six years? I think it's different between Europe and America because in Europe, music directors do not have all the powers that I just outlined. So in the Berlin Phil, for example, the musicians decide who gets in. Right. Um, and in British orchestras, the musicians decide as well. The music director is just the guy who conducts the most concerts. In America, obviously, the music director has a lot more control. And when you think of the, the, some of the great orchestras in this country, I do think that the music director had an influence on the sound, particularly Cleveland, which you brought up. Um, George Zell, the Hungarian-American conductor, was music director of Cleveland for well, almost 40 years. Yeah. And in that time, his musical taste shaped the sound of the orchestra enormously. There's a funny story about um, that James Levine told. James Levine used to be George Zell's assistant. Mm -hmm. He was the assistant conductor of the Cleveland Orchestra. Okay. And Zell was complaining about why the strings couldn't make a more lush European sound. And Levine said, Uncle George, because he called him Uncle, it's because you always choose the people with sound that's like this, yeah. bing, which yeah. is, you know, the, that's the way the Cleveland Orchestra used to sound. And that just is a reflection of, Zell would always choose the candidates who played in the strings absolutely perfectly with a sound with a lot of direction. Yeah. But that's not necessarily what you need if you want a big, lush European sound, that's not what you want. And when you go to hear Berlin, they don't sound like that. Right. They have this big, brassy, full string sound. It's not that kind of very directional laser sound. Laser yeah. sound. Uh -huh. um, and often when you listen to the Cleveland Orchestra from the 60s and, se and up to 1970 when Zell died, it sounds like a laser beam. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the best descriptions of it. It's this sort of, so he definitely influenced that. Um, I don't... I mean, I've, I have actually hired a lot of the orchestra here now, but I don't think that I've, that, that the audition has been, is reflected in the sound. I think just what I ask for is maybe reflected in the sound, yeah. in rehearsal. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it, it's a really fascinating process, and it, it's one that is intended to uh, just give uh, level the playing field and let the, the, the candidate who is playing best, at least on that day, we all have our good days and our bad days, but uh, be the one who's selected. And I, I think it's, um, it, it's a, there, there's almost nothing else comparable out there in terms of being hired for a job. Mm -hmm. but, um, it's a strange process. It's one of my favorite parts of my job when the candidate who's won the audition comes into my studio and I say, congratulations, you yeah, mean, it's, it's one of the things that I enjoy the most about the job. I bet. It. So. Well, thanks for describing that. It's uh, it's it's really great to know how how this how these musicians become part of the family, and um, we'll uh, hope to be featuring all of these musicians uh, again in the fall. Oh God, I hope so. I miss everybody, and I miss making music. So yeah, fingers crossed that we will open on September twenty eighth. Yeah. So everybody, do your part. Stay safe. Wear your mask, wash your hands. Yes. And, um, yeah. Well, thanks for chatting about this. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. All right.